So I do believe that one day when I come into the house of God, the people of God is going to praise God without me having to ask Him to praise God. The people of God is going to help somebody else when they are praising God. Because you don't know what that person has been through. And we are in the hall. It's going on. Hallelujah. Praise God. Everything might be all right in your house. Everything might be going like you want it. But keep living because it's going to knock on your door. And you're going to want somebody to help you. Praise God. Hallelujah. We have got to quit living and walking by our feelings. But know what the word of God said. And act on that word. And let this flesh line up with the word of God. Quit moving by feelings. We are people of God called by faith to walk by faith and not what we see, not what we feel, but what we know, which is the word of God. Hallelujah. Praise God. Hallelujah. I just have to give you a preliminary because I refuse to let the enemy have his way in the house of God. I'm going to bless the name of God because I appreciate life, health, and strength. Every breath that comes out of my body, I give God the thanks, the glory, and the honor for he's worthy to be praised. Praise God. Hallelujah. Everybody don't praise him the same way. But whether you praise him with a smile or your hand raised or standing up, however you praise him, let that praise go forth and let him know you are grateful that you're part of the family. Because if it had not been for his grace, would none of us be in this house. But because of his grace, has he spared us another day. I appreciate God for each and every one of you. Those that are online, we thank you for joining in with us today. And we just praise God that the word will bless your soul. Hallelujah. Let us go before God in a word of prayer. Father, in the precious name of Jesus, Lord, we appreciate you for who you are. Because who you are makes your word that right by yourself. Father, we declare that your word will go forth unhindered. Father, we say, do what you will as you will. Let the word fall on good soil. Let it take root that your people might be encouraged. In the mighty name of Jesus, Lord, we call it so. And we bless you for it. In Jesus' name, amen. While you're yet standing and have your word, go with me to Galatians the chapter 4. Galatians chapter 4. Praise God, and I will be reading from the New King James Version. Praise God. Galatians 4, beginning at verse 3, and I'm reading New King James. Even so, we, when we were children, were in bondage under the elements of the world. But when the fullness of time had come, 
God sent forth his son, born of a woman, born under the law, to redeem those who were under the law, that we might receive the adoption as sons. And because you are sons, God has sent forth the spirit of his son into your hearts, crying out, Abba, Father, therefore, you are no longer a slave, but a son. And if a son, then an heir of God through Christ. But then indeed, when you did not know God, you served those which by nature are not God. But now after you have known God, or rather are known by God, how is it that you turn again to the weak and beggarly elements to which you desire again to be in bondage? Praise God. You may be seated. As I was beginning to ask the Lord, what did he want to share today? Praise God. The message of grace popped up in my spirit. Because we as the people of God and saints of God, we don't really understand grace like we should understand. Grace is what causes us to be able to walk in the newness of life. Because the Bible even lets us know, for by grace are we saved. It was because of the goodness and God's grace that it allowed us to become a part of his family by faith in the work that he done. Because it tells us that it was by grace and not by works. Now, we look here in Galatians, and it talks about when we were born, we were children under the heritage, or, or born, was born in bondage under the elements of the world. But in the fullness of time, God sent his son so that he could redeem us from those that were under the law. Praise God that we might be received as adoption as sons. And as it where it says sons, it's including the females as well. So don't don't feel like you excluded because it's God's people. Amen. Praise God. And we know the story. Praise God. Abraham. God had promised Abraham that when Abraham obeyed God, God changed his name from Abram to Abraham and he named him as father of faith. And when he spoke to him and he says, I need you to get up out of your country and go to where I show you. By faith, Abraham gathered up and started his journey. He didn't know where God was taking him, but God promised him that he would make him the father of many nations. And Abraham began to think because God changed his name from Abram to Abraham. You see, when God calling you and he's got a work for you, then he's got the name that he has for you. Praise God. And that name is going to remind you of what God called you to do. And so when he changed that name from Abram to Abraham, it meant father of many. And so Abraham received the promise that God spoke, but he was wondering, I don't even have one son. So how in the world am I going to be the father of many nations? And I have not. A child. But because he believed what God said, God told him, I will make you a great nation and you will be given a son. Praise God. And through that son, the nations will be birthed. Praise God. And we know that God was talking about Isaac as the promised child. Praise God. And we know the story. Time was going on and on and on and on. No child showed up, but they knew what the promise of God said. So what happened? Get a little bit impatient. Sound familiar to anybody? God spoke to you, showed you some things, told you some things, and it looked like God ain't doing nothing. But you got to understand when God spoke, he spoke. And that that he spoke, it is so. And that that he spoke, he's able to complete and God is not a man that he should lie. But that that God's spoken, he will do. What we are required to do is by faith receive that word and let that word be fulfilled in our lives. 
We're not going to always understand it because we're not God. We are his children. He made us in his image after him so that we would give him praise. And so he want to work through us as his children. But it takes faith to do that. So since they was thinking about the promise, him and Sarah, you know, they said, okay, don't look like, you know, we're getting up here in age here and we all pass by the natural childbearing age and all of that. We're going to help God out. And I guess, Abraham, the best thing for you to do is go on over in there with the handmaid. Y'all get together and let her bring forth this child. Abraham didn't want to do it. But y'all know how it is when a woman wants you to do something. If you don't kind of start moving there, time she finished getting on your nerves, you're going on and do it. Even though he didn't want to, he talked to God and went on in. Okay. So they brought forth the son, Ishmael. But Ishmael won't the promised child. That won't God's child that he promised. But because Abraham belonged to God, Abraham, the Lord said, I'm going to bless Ishmael and he's going to be great too. Because of you, Abraham, I'm going to bless him, but he's not the one through which the promise was come. Ishmael was born of the servant under bondage, which represented the law in the old covenant. Isaac was the son of promise. And when he wanted to move through the son of promise, which was grace, the new covenant. And as we know our history, praise God, when the two of them was born, they was at odds against each other. Now Sarah is the one that encouraged Abraham to go to the servant and have the child. Then she got sick of the woman and said, ain't no way her son going to share in what God promised. Get her out of here. Well, Abraham loved the son. I mean, you know, old man, and he had a son in his old age. He felt right proud. But she said, he got the, the, the son and the mom got to go. But yet she encouraged this from the beginning. But what God was trying to help us understand and help us to see is the law and grace don't go together. And this was to give us a natural vision of how we must understand that we are under grace and not under the law. That's what God really was trying to show and represent. But God said, I'm still going to bless Ishmael because he's part of your seed, Abraham. But my promise is coming through the son, Isaac. And so when God had Isaac, praise God. That was the one that the nations were going to be born, birthed out of. And he, Ishmael was going to birth and be a great nation as well. But the promise was through Isaac. And it said that the child of bondage and the child of promise was at odds against each other. What God was showing us, if you're trying to obey and walk out the law, it's going to conflict with grace. When we understand what salvation is all about, and when we go back to the word of God now, and, and I know, and that's why the Lord reminds me so many times and have me to encourage people is when somebody is new in the Lord, you can't be beating them over the head with a bunch of rules. Talking about don't do this, don't do that. You're trying to bring them on the law. For the Bible says that we are cleansed through the word. So what we need to be doing is loving them through the word. Directing them through the word and quit trying to look at what they're doing and beat them on the head for what they're doing because they are being cleansed by the word. 
And if we look throughout the Bible, different examples where law is in place, I don't care how good they were, they broke them laws. They couldn't keep them. They broke the laws. But the purpose of the law was to point the people, God's people, to the, the promised Savior that was going to be coming to the world. That's what the, the law was to let them know that there's going to be a better covenant but the law will let you see your wrong so that you will know and be able to see Jesus when he's coming to redeem those under bondage, redeem them from being under bondage and set them free by his grace, not by their words. And if you want to look at an example in the word of God in Luke 18, y'all remember the story about the rich young ruler. He had all this wealth and he went to him and he says, Master, what must I do, you know, to be saved? And so the Lord perceived where, what he was coming from because, see, he had followed the law. And so the Lord started naming him the, the, the Ten Commandments, basically, because he realized this ruler was coming from the law. And so the ruler going to be smart after Jesus finished. And then he says, well, all of those from my youth have I kept. And then Jesus said, mm-hmm, but you like one thing. This is what you must do. Go and sell all that you have and give it to the poor. When that young ruler, because he was young and rich, that God asked him to give up, not some, but all that he had accumulated and give it to the poor. It says he was sad. And I'm, I'm paraphrasing a little bit, but that didn't set well. And he walked away. But listen at what he did. He said he kept all the law. But even keeping all the law was not good enough for a holy God. That's why he says, I must send a Savior that will be holy, and the Savior that I'm going to send, he is going to be your righteousness. Not of your own, but his righteousness. And the enemy holds the church today by trying to keep us walking by rules and regulations. And even when we try so hard to dot all the I's and cross all the T's, we still miss one or two. And then he make you feel so bad. But the Bible says we are saved by grace and not by our works. And in order for that to happen, we must be willing to receive the grace that has been bestowed upon us. If we don't, we're going to still walk under them rules and be in bondage, even though we've been made free. This is what the word was trying to let us see here. We must walk under the grace that the Lord has given us. And when we look over there in Romans 10th chapter, praise God, verse 3, it says, For they being ignorant of God's righteousness and seeking to establish their own righteousness have not submitted to the righteousness of God. For Christ is the end of the law for righteousness to everyone who believes. Christ is our righteousness. Now, what Christ wants us to do is walk according to his word. But realizing that we can only do that by the grace that he's bestowed upon us. And I didn't give you the topic, but for the topic it would be by God's grace. By God's grace are we sitting in here today. By God's grace are we even living, moving, and have our being. 
It's only by the grace of God. And in Romans here, it talks about that Christ is the end of the law for righteousness. And when you begin to look back through your word and look at history, the law always pointed to your faults. What you didn't get right, what the punishment was behind for messing up. But grace says, you messed up, but I still love you. You messed up, but I'm going to forgive you. You messed up, but it's been thrown in the sea of forgiveness, and I'm not bringing it back up to you because I sent my son Christ to pay the penalty for what we should have been paying for ourselves. But we weren't able to do it. Well, we talked about it last week when they nailed him to the cross. Everything that would hinder us, every sin, every sickness, everything that was against us was nailed on that cross. And Jesus took that punishment in our place. And when he did, and when it was all done, he hung his head and gave up the ghost. And prior to that, he says, it is finished. I've done what my father sent me to do. I have shed my own blood to pay the penalty for the people that you sent me to. And because I shed my blood, I took the penalty. That debt that they owed has already been paid. And it's by grace and not by works. So we can't be saved by doing just good. I don't care how good we are, goodness will not save you. But only the grace of God through faith will our salvation come. That's why he said you can't boast about your good works. What you've done don't mean nothing in God's sight. He appreciate it, but it ain't going to get you in heaven if you ain't accepted him by faith. And the work that he done, it's by grace. And when we understand grace, we can walk this thing out a whole lot better. Because, see, when you mess up, the devil is wearing your mind out. You are walking in guilt and condemnation like nobody can describe. Because you're trying to figure out, I've been saved 100 years, 50 years, whatever, 30 years. Going to church all the time. How in the world I get in this situation? Because as it talks about here in Romans, instead of submitting to God's righteousness, they were establishing their own righteousness. That's why when you got a bunch of rules, now don't get me wrong, rules and stuff point you to the wrong that you've done. But it ain't the rules that get you saved. It's the faith in God's word and the work that he's done. That's what gets us saved. That's why I said, the law will point you to the wrong. See, when we think we're all of that, and then God remind you and show you what you're doing and all of that, then you realize you ain't what you thought you were. But see, he didn't come to condemn us. He came to save us. He came to forgive. And that's why when we accept his grace, acknowledge it, confess with our mouth, We'll say, he didn't say, if you stop this, stop that, you're going to be saved. He says, no, if you believe in what I've done and confess with your mouth, whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. But you know, we read right over that because man has made this gospel so hard. If you tell folk, everybody know when they're wrong. Ain't nobody got to tell you you're wrong. You know when you messed up. So I don't need to tell you that. What I need to tell you if you messed up, how you can get cleaned up. And that's by the grace of God. Confessing and receiving the grace that he bestowed upon us. Because he said that Christ was the end of our righteousness. So when we mess up, we need to say, I am the righteousness of God through Christ. 
because he paid the penalty for my mess up. Now, that ain't easy when you know you're wrong. But the Bible says we walk by faith, not by sight. Faith don't mean you always understand and, 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 and feel what you're doing. But faith says I do it because that's what I'm instructed and I'm obedient in spite of what I feel, in spite of what I see. Because if we go on what we see, we'd sit down and close it and say there ain't no hope. Because there would be no hope. In the word, we got to understand just how much God really loves us. Do y'all remember the issue when the uh, Samarian woman uh, went to the well and Jesus was waiting there at the well and went and asked her about a drink of water and all of that? And, you know, normally you either go early in the morning, but she went around noon, day in the middle of the day because she was trying to get them early folk or women there to get their water and get out in the way so she wouldn't hear them gossiping about the fact that the man she had now want hers and she already had five others and she didn't want to hear all of that. So she go when they ain't there because y'all know how folk talk. Instead of encouraging, instead of praying, they talking about what you're doing. Wonder why they won't change your mouth on them. You putting the words out there in the enemy, wearing them out. So Jesus said, give me some water to drink. She looked at him saying, now why he asking me for some water? Because you know, I'm Samaritan. We don't, we don't associate like that. But he says that if you knew who you was asking, I'll give you water that's everlasting and you won't thirst no more. And then he said, where your husband? Uh, she said, I have no husband. He said, you spoke well because the one you're with now ain't yours. But, 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 now, what did he, but what did he say? And, and, and the, um, the folk come around, you know, they, they caught the woman in the, in, in adultery and all of that. And then they wanted to, uh, accuse her and she was, she was guilty. And they said that according to the law of Moses, she's supposed to be stoned. Jesus didn't bother to respond to them verbally. But what did he do? He got wrote in the sand there. But he looked at the woman. After he wrote in the sand and they read it, they shut the mouth because one of them standing there probably was with the woman. <laughs> and he looked at the woman and he said, any of them condemn you here? He says, neither do I. Go and sin no more. See, he gave her the news that would set her free. They wanted to bring the news of pointing fingers and finding fault. What God is trying to show us, the gospel is the good news of Jesus Christ. It's God's place to do the cleansing, and the growing up. Our job is to be living Episcopal so that when we walk before them, we can be read as that word. They can see Christ living in us. They can see the love of Christ through us being shown on them because they already know they messed up. They need hope, not somebody else to push them down even further. Do they ain't never coming. All you're doing is pushing them out the church instead of letting them come in with God's love to help them grow and be cleansed through the word. But man tried to do the cleansing. But the Bible says you are cleansed through the word. As you learn the word, then you begin to lay aside because you understand it's not me, but it's the Holy Spirit that lives in me and my understanding of the word. And through me, he's walking this word out. And that's how I'm growing because now I understand the word and accept the word. It's by God's grace. And as I begin to wrap this thing up, because I'm going to tell you, if, 
people could hear more of God's grace instead of all the um, the negative, the punishment, you're going to hell. You messed up. Instead of God loves you. For he so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son so that we could be a part of his family. They say, he, met, he loved me and I messed up. You have to tell them, the word says, while we were yet sinners, he sent his son to pay the penalty that was due us. So a man that knew no sin took on the price and paid the debt that was due us. And because of that, we received his righteousness, not ours. That's why the Lord said, it ain't by no works because he know we couldn't do it. And his salvation won't go rest on the fact based on what we were going to do. Do the enemy win all the time. But it's by faith in God's word. Or by grace are you saved, not by works, lest any man should boast. All these self-righteous folk ain't going to work. Because they're establishing their own rules, their own laws. This is what you got to do. One, two, three, four, five. You break that, you out. They mess up, they're ready to put them out in church. Instead of loving them, say, if you confess it to the Lord, he will forgive you. The Bible says, if any confess, he would forgive and cleanse because his blood has already been over 2,000 years. He said it was finished back then before some, we were even going even born and he already done took care of it for us. Because everybody was born and shaping in iniquity that came into the world. So we all needed a savior. But the price was already paid. All we had to do was receive his work by grace. And see, when he died for us on that cross and said it is finished. What we had need of ourselves, it was taken care of. And when the enemy comes back to try you for your faults, you have to tell the enemy, that's double jeopardy. You can't try me for the same crime. I've been acquitted, so you can't retry me over that same crime. The price already been paid. Jesus' blood paid for all my sins and cleansed me from all unrighteousness. But while we are trying to walk it out, what we need to do when we mess up, we just have to turn around and speak and say, I am the righteousness of God through Christ Jesus, which redeemed me. Still messed up. Might keep messing up again. But as I keep confessing it, faith going to rise and that word going to connect with my spirit. And then that habit that I thought I couldn't break. Next thing you know, I found out, Lord, I ain't done that in a long time. I'm free. But it's because the spirit of the living God on the inside, connecting with the word of God that I've been taught and walking out, begins to clean the path, clear the way so I can make the next step. Because what I've done is I've taken it off of me to do works and rested in the grace that was bestowed upon me, acknowledging, Father, I can't do it. But through you, I can do all things. It's your strength, not mine. But because I'm walking in your strength, you're going to give me the ability to overcome. You already told me, I win. For I can do all things through Christ, which strengthens me. But I have to receive that by faith and allow it to be so in my life. But the enemy makes you think and people make you think you messed up, go somewhere and sit down. God through which. No, you ain't. As long as you got breath in your body. The Lord made it clear how much he loved us. And that when we confess it, we are born again into the kingdom of God. That's been established. But see, if you don't know that it's established, the enemy will whip you ragged. You'll be down and feeling terrible all the time. You won't even want to move because you don't feel like you're worthy. In and of ourselves, ain't none of us worthy because the word says all of our righteousness is just like filthy rags. 
to a holy God. But when he see us, he sees his son because the blood of his son was shed for us. That blood cleanses from all unrighteousness. We are the righteousness of God through Christ Jesus. For the word said he came and put an end to the law. Now all that is saying is the law is still there but all the law going to do is drive you down to your knees to let you realize how much you need a savior because it's going to point out your wrong. But grace is going to say come on I love you. Give it to me so I can throw it in the sea of forgiveness. Confess that wrong. I still love you. I got you. The, that last example in the, the Bible says about the good shepherd. He says he rejoices over one soul that repents and turns. And if one is missing out of the hundred, he's going to leave the 99 that's all right. And he's going to get that one. That's how much his love is for us. When we mess up, God ain't putting us aside somewhere. He's going to get us. But we got to let him receive us so he can bring us back into the fold. And when he went to get the lamp, you know, some of the artists' rendition was when Christ went or the shepherd went to bring that lost sheep back, they have him picture with it on his back. That means all you got to do is allow him to carry you because sometimes you can't, you don't really feel like you can come back. But he went after you and said, come on, I got you. I got you. Come on. It's almost like a mother with a child crying. That child get to crying, but when mama grabbed that child in her arm and she began to rock him and say, it's going to be all right, baby. It's going to be all right. And she starts, shh, shh, it's going to be all right. That baby start calming down. Christ's love for us is just that great. You mess up, he already knew you were going to mess up. That's why he says, I'm sending my son, Jesus, who is righteousness, who knew no sin to be sin for us. So that when he shed his blood, it washed all of our sins away. And when he sees us, he sees a holy people. But we base holiness just on act. Holiness is receiving God's grace. See, grace supplies the law demands. The law says do this, do that. Grace says here, it's given, not received. Do you get the picture? By God's grace. Yeah. And I thank God for the word. Amen. Yeah. Praise God.